Good afternoon and welcome Duke alumni and friends to this session of the Duke Alumni Forever Learning Institute hosted in partnership with Duke Women's Weekend. The Forever Learning Institute is an interdisciplinary educational program organized in a set of thematic courses. My name is Katie Douglas and I am the Climate Program Manager in the Nicholas School of the Environment as well as a proud member of the class of 2011. For today's program, we are joined by both an in-person audience with our Women's Weekend attendees, as well as a virtual audience with learners um, taking part in the Forever Learning Institute, as well as the, the Women's Weekend virtual ticket. So I'd like to extend a special welcome to our Duke community members who are joining us virtually this afternoon. For our virtual audience, please use the chat to tell us where you are participating from. Uh, the chat will also be used for asking questions uh, for our speakers during the program and we will take questions from both our in-person and virtual audiences at the conclusion of the presentations. Today's session will be exploring how leaders working in ocean conservation, plastics, oceanography, and coastal resilience are charting a more sustainable future for our oceans. The program is part of the theme Climate Change Makers, inspired by the Duke Climate Commitment. Moderating our session today is Toddy Steelman, Standback Dean of the Nicholas School of the Environment. Toddy holds a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and International Studies from West Virginia University, a Master in Public Affairs from Princeton University, and a PhD from right here at Duke in the Nicholas School. She's a recognized expert in environmental and resource policy, focusing on community responses to wildfires and how communities and agencies interact for more effective wildfire management. Prior to coming back home to Duke, she was a faculty member at the University of Colorado at Denver uh, and North Carolina State University, as well as the first permanent executive director of the University of Saskatchewan's School of Environment and Sustainability. She has served as the, the standback dean of the Nicholas School since 2018 and was recently reappointed for a second five-year term in that role. She is also one of the three principal leaders of the Duke Climate Commitment, which was announced last September and seeks to leverage all facets of the institution towards developing and implementing just and equitable climate solutions. And it is in that role that I am particularly grateful for her work um, because that's how I get to work with her. So welcome to Women's Weekend and the Forever Learning Institute, Tati. Thank you, Katie. Um, can you all hear me okay? Is that all good? Very good. Um, well, thank you all for coming and for your interest in climate and the oceans. Um, let me just start by, and, and welcome to everybody who is with us online. Um, let me start by uh, having a show of hands who's been near an ocean in the last year. Yep, pretty much everybody, right? <laughs> we all love oceans, right? So oceans are really important to us for a whole variety of reasons. Um, they sequester carbon, they generate oxygen. In fact, almost half the oxygen on our Earth is generated by oceans. It's really a, a fantastic sort of statistic if you're not familiar with that. They provide habitat, uh, they create recreation and tourism, so if you were near an ocean in the last year, that's probably why you were. Um, they provide sustenance for communities, both near and far. Um, they are a source of wonder and awe for us, an inspiration for art for millennia. Um, and they regulate our climate. So they play a lot of different diverse roles for us and society at large. So protecting our oceans is really important, really important, perhaps now more than, more than ever. And our oceans currently have a lot of threats. Um, there are a lot of challenges facing our oceans. Um, acidification, um, unsustainable fisheries management, uh, biodiversity loss, rising sea levels, I think we're all familiar with that, and of course, plastics pollution. So in order to counter those challenges and deal with those challenges, what we need is a generation of leaders who are really committed to helping us understand those problems and more importantly, fight for and create solutions to those challenges. And we have four amazing women here today to talk about that to us. So I think we're incredibly fortunate to have the panel that we have been able to assemble with us today. I'm really quite proud that they all hail from the Nicholas School in one form or the other. We have two current students with us. Um, I'm going to introduce all the way from the left to the right, so just to make sure we all know who's who. Um, Anjali Boyd right there is with us. She's a current doctoral student. If you could help me welcome her. Very good. Sanduni Liangamage is with us. She is a current Master's of Environmental Management student who is with us. Everybody help us welcome Sanduni. 
Um, Shannon, uh, Charlotte Hut- Gray Hudson. I, I always get messed up when I try to go for all the names. I apologize on that one. Um, is a graduate of our program and the current director of the Lenfest program. And Shannon Switzer Swanson, here to my immediate left, um, is with National Geographic Explorer and is also an assistant professor in environmental studies at California State at San Marco. Can you help me welcome both of them as well? All right, our plan for you today is that we've got a couple of stand alone presentations. So both Anjali and Sanduni will give us a presentation. And then we're going to do some round robin questions. And we're also going to reserve a little bit of time at the end for questions from the audience. We will start with uh, Sanduni and then we'll move on to Anjali. Thank you, Sanduni. My name is Sandini Uyanagamage, and I'm a graduate student here at the Nicholas School of the Environment, pursuing a Master of Environmental Management at Duke University. And my focus is corporate sustainability practices. And prior to Duke, uh, I was an environmental consultant uh, with a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering. So you must be wondering how a chemical engineer ended up in the ocean space. So today, I would like to share my story of how I found my non-traditional pathway towards the ocean. Um, I was born in Sri Lanka, which is a beautiful island in the Indian Ocean, which is also a tourism hotspot known for its marine life and beautiful beaches. But I didn't uh, build my connection to the ocean while I was in Sri Lanka till many years later when I moved to Abu Dhabi in the UAE, where I first attended an international film festival as a volunteer and got to watch a movie on plastic pollution. And that was the first time in 2009 that I learned about these ocean issues that were taking place all over the world. Um, My curiosity kept growing on the ocean. So I would read articles, watch webinars, documentaries, listen to podcasts. Anything I could get my hands on around the ocean interested me. So whether it was about discarded fishing gear or coral bleaching, I was very curious and kept growing my knowledge in this space. I moved to New Mexico, and, New Mexico and Colorado, two states that are not close to the coast, but my, <laughs> my curiosity did not die down. Um, so I continued my research, uh, my personal research on ocean topics. One thing I realized was that I was finding it difficult to believe that I belonged in the ocean space because I would come across scuba divers, marine biologists, um, people who did not quite look like me. Um, And one day I watched a TED talk by a National Geographic explorer, uh, Asha DeVos. Uh, She's a Sri Lankan marine biologist. And her journey inspired me. She was a woman who pursued a career in marine biology in a culture where marine biology wasn't seen as a a job uh, for women to do. Um, And she also constantly advocated for women in color to be in ocean spaces. So just listening to someone like her really motivated me to continue my journey uh, to find my place in this ocean puzzle. One day, while completing a certificate in corporate social responsibility, I came across an article by a hospitality chain conducting corporate responsibility efforts around ocean conservation. And that's when it fell into place for me. I would be able to use my environmental consulting and sustainability background towards tourism, a sector that was highly dependent on a healthy ocean. And so I spent an year looking for master's programs so that I could really dedicate more time to learn more about the ocean. Beyond my extra time that I would spend watching documentaries or listening to podcasts, I really wanted to dedicate two years just to learn more about the ocean. And the only program that I was interested in was the Nicholas School's master's program due to its strong marine science and conservation program. And so I found a few opportunities to grow my knowledge while I was here. Um, So Last summer, I got an opportunity to do an internship with a faculty here at the Nicholas School and EDF on blue carbon. Blue carbon is essentially coastal ecosystems such as mangroves and seagrasses that have a high potential for carbon sequestration. So they're a very attractive natural climate solution right now for companies that are building out their sustainability strategies. Our research involved looking into the social aspects of blue carbon projects, one thing that constantly gets missed in the conversation. What are the challenges around community participation in blue carbon projects? What are the aspects in terms of equity we should be paying attention to when developing a mangrove conservation initiative? These were the kinds of topics we were researching last summer, and I have been lucky to continue that work as my master's project, where along with two other students, 
we're developing a blue carbon portal that would allow stakeholders from any part of the blue economy to really understand what are some of the financial, economic, social aspects they should be paying attention to when trying to come up with a blue carbon solution. Secondly, I came across the Oceans at Duke Student Club two years ago. It's an interdisciplinary student club that was formed to organize uh, Duke's inaugural Blue Economy Summit. Um, and this year, I took on the role as president to organize our second annual Blue Economy Summit, which is actually kicking off tonight. Um, and one thing that uh, I'm very excited about as being a part of this organization is that we have students from all over Duke. So it's not just the Nicholas School. We have students from Sanford, Fuqua, the law school, and we're all exploring topics together to come up with interdisciplinary solutions, which has been really um, insightful for someone like me. And finally, one thing I realized was building community has been really important in this space, getting to know all the other experts who have been doing this work for years. And so I would take any opportunity during my time here at Duke to attend ocean events, whether that was UN World Oceans Day, World Oceans Week, or COP27 a few months ago, I got an opportunity to attend um, the Climate Summit in Egypt and was invited to be a facilitator for a roundtable discussion on um, a common agenda for the shared ocean. So here we had different stakeholders from all over the world talking about some of the challenges on how important voices are being left out of the ocean conservation discussions. And so I was very appreciative of learning all these different perspectives from many different voices in the ocean space. So I hope um, from everything that I shared, there's two things that you took away. One thing is persistence. Um, my journey in the ocean space began in 2009, I believe, and it took me many, many years to really figure out what my niche was, and persistence was so important. So if you have a passion for ocean conservation and you're not a scuba diver or a marine biologist, I still think you can build, uh, you can join this uh, network of uh, ocean professionals because we need diverse voices collaborating together um, to push forward these uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives. Um, in the climate crisis conversations. And then secondly, um, I mentioned earlier, I'm an engineer and a consultant. So one thing that was uh, a barrier to me was feeling that sense of exclusion in ocean spaces. And so building community, finding people who um, were willing to speak with me and share their experience played a big role in helping me continue um, my journey in this space. And so whether it was women who were speaking up for diversity in the ocean space or women from the ocean space uh, or small island uh, nations, people who could relate to some of the challenges I was going through really helped me move forward on my journey. And one thing I would say that really would be helpful if you're in the ocean conservation space is to broaden your network. And so be willing to bring in those people who have a passion because they have the determination and they're ready to put in their all uh, to help out in this uh, broad uh, conversation on the ocean. Um, so one thing I'd like to leave you all with is that uh, my journey is still continuing. And I'm excited to see who else I will meet on this journey. Um, the past few months, I've met people in the tech sector who are interested in getting into the oceans. And so I'm just looking forward to seeing who else I will meet as I continue my journey. Thank you, everyone. So let me just start, and I'm going to start on this end and go down this way, um, and ask all of you, what motivates you? Like, what gets you up in the morning, and why is this work important to you? So, Shannon, I'll give it to you first. Okay, great. Um, is this on? I think I'm going to take this off for now. Um, hello, everybody. Great to be here. Um, so first, I'll just give a brief introduction to um, my, my current work and past work. Um, I am currently a professor of assist, um, an assistant professor of env environmental studies at um, Cal State San Marcos um, in North County, San Diego. Um, you might be wondering where that, where that was. It's actually where I grew up. So I did um, my undergraduate at UC Santa Barbara in biology, uh, came to here to the Nicholas School and did my master's in um, coastal environmental management. Uh, then went on, loved, fell in love with research here um, and specifically social science research in the ocean space. So that was really fun to hear about. Um, 
and went on to continue my PhD at um, Stanford University in their Emmet Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources. Um, prior to going back to school, though, there was a big gap of time where I worked as a conservation photojournalist um, and science communicator and worked with National Geographic in various capacities. Um, and most recently as a um, TV host for a documentary on uh, the water conservation in the West. So science communication is still a really big part of what I do and what I'm passionate about. Um, but I have, but now I'm doing that alongside academia and teaching. Um, and so what motivates me to do the work that I do was the question actually. Sorry, I'm getting there. Um, so. I think I was reflecting on this because we, we were prompted with these earlier. Um, I think what most motivates me and always has motivated all my kind of lines of inquiry, either as a journalist or as a researcher, is really trying to question my own assumptions about the way the world works. Um, and, you know, not take things for granted, our understanding, my understanding of how, how these different sy systems, both social and ecological work, and how they work together. So trying to untangle that and push, push past my own initial assumptions or biases around how I see the world really motivates the work that I do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think at the end of the day that it's, it's care itself and caring for the systems that sustain us and how we can give back to those systems that really ultimately motivates that mm -hmm. whole endeavor within the context of my research. Very good, very, very good. Charlotte. Thank you. Uh, Good afternoon, all. It's thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. My name is Charlotte Hudson, and I direct the Lenfest Ocean Program, which is based at the Pew Charitable Trusts. That is a very long name, but to put that a little bit in context, um, I basically I run a program um, that's a philanthropic program, and so my job is actually to give out grants. I actually give money to marine conservation science, um, and have been doing so for about this is embarrassing, almost 20 years. Um, I did not start there though. I started my career actually outside out of Duke. Um, I was looking uh, for anybody who would talk to me when I graduated. <laughs> and I have to tell this great story though that um, I found one of my most fabulous mentors who now is very well known in the Duke community in the name of Steve Rohde. Mm -hmm. He That was before he worked here, um, both at the Nicholas Institute and taught at the law school. Um, and he hired me to research, to be the scientist on a project. He's a lawyer by training, and he was running a law firm that was working on uh, ocean conservation legal uh, challenges where the government wasn't upholding its duties to protect the oceans. And they needed a scientist to read all of the lawsuit, all of the legal briefs, and to read what they call the record, the administrative record. For those of you who are lawyers, you know this well. I did not know anything about administrative records, which is probably why I took the job at the time. Um, <laughs> only to find out that 71 binders later, uh, you know, three ring binders later, I realized what I'd signed up for. Sorry, Steve. Um, he is also here, so if anybody see you at tomorrow, I see him tomorrow at the uh, at the um, Blue, Economy. Blue Economy Forum. Yeah. This is too long an introduction. Long and the short of it is, I got my introduction um, to the science policy interface where I now work through working through the law and what judges understood about science, mm -hmm. which is not as much as you would hope, <laughs> right? Um, I then uh, went on to several years working for uh, Oceana, which is a nonprofit NGO that had just started at the time, and then realized in some of my work that I didn't think we were getting enough funding for the issues I thought were important. And so I thought, well, why don't I actually become the funder instead and get to think about where the money goes? And so um, in 2005, I uh, started a career on the philanthropic side, and over that time really evolved thinking about giving money away for science in a different way. So we are science grant makers in every way you think. It's a very administrative paper pushing job. However, the part that inspires me um, is, is about making change and thinking about impact of, of the impact of marine science on the ground in a different way. And so we have evolved at the Lenfest Ocean Program to not and this is not always a big fan of some of the scientists, even some of our grantees at Duke, um, we don't actually ask the researchers what they want to study. We actually go to communities and ask them what their challenges are. We then go back and think about, well, who are the experts working on those issues 
in the scientific space? And are those questions that the communities are facing, can they be answered through science? I mean, many times they're not. They're policy questions. They may be pol big P political questions. They may be small P political questions. But if there are science and research information needs, whether they be social science or natural science, we then think about who those experts are and then reach out to those experts. And we have done that both through um, open calls for proposals, research, um, what they call requests for proposals, and we've done it through invitation only. That's a whole, um, those are some ways that we are also thinking about our transparency. But it very much for us starts with the communities and the questions on the ground, the needs of the stakeholders and decision makers and the communities on the ground. And then we bring science to bear on that. So I should say, after that long-winded introduction, um, what motivates me most is about the evolution in the community where when we started this work, there were fewer scientists and communities who were willing to engage with each other. Mm. Those communities were very much the communities and decision makers needed the information, but they there weren't inroads, there weren't ways to reach out to scientists who were working on the issues. Same thing, mm -hmm. the scientists, and I remember this from when I was at the Marine Lab, I remember one colleague of mine got a paper published, she was so excited in conservation biology, and he said, now I've got this paper published on X, I won't tell you what it is, now the world is gonna change, that's gonna be impact, <laughs> right? Now this endangered species is gonna be saved. And at the time, I actually thought that, too. I mean, I thought, oh, good, this paper in conservation biology, done. <laughs> Turns out that policymakers don't read conservation biology, <laughs> right? They actually don't read any scientific journals. So if you are going to have impact, if you are going to transfer science through communications or through stakeholder engagement, it is not going to be through peer-reviewed publications. You need to publish. That is a mandatory baseline. But then you've got to take that to another step. So when I see that happen, that is what motivates me. So sorry. Very good. Very good. <laughs> That's good. Cindy? Hard one to follow. <laughs> um, I think my motivation is a mix of two things. Um, one is I think the reason I'm in this space is also because of my love for the environment um, and just being by the ocean. These are things I enjoy. And so now being aware of all these challenges it feels strange to just sit back and not do anything. And so what motivates me is knowing that we have to be taking action and um, doing our part uh, to take care of the environment. And so that really drives me. And the second thing that drives me is this idea that, um, especially in the ocean space, there's constant innovation. There's always these new ideas, new ways to do things, but also ways to use existing traditional knowledge to push forward um, ocean conservation initiatives. And so what motivates me is this idea that we can find ways to collaborate with all these different stakeholders to push forward solutions. And I want to be a part of that, mm -hmm. um, that uh, you know, journey. And so I think what motivates me is those two things. Very good. Anjali, take a moment and introduce yourself too, so that we know who you are as you begin to speak, if you yeah, don't mind I'm too. I'm not sure, is my mic on? It might be still off from earlier. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, my name is Anjali Boyd. I am a marine ecologist, an educator, entrepreneur, and I'm also an elected official here in Durham. Um, I was born and raised here. And so, um, part yes. <laughs> um, and so I guess part of like what motivates me is also being raised here in Durham. If you're not familiar with Black Wall Street, um, there is such a rich history of like black success, innovation, entrepreneurship in this area. And so for me, I see what's happening in the oceans as this huge economic opportunity, as well as like this conservation, um, the need for conservation, stuff like that. And so a big part of what drives me is having communities of color miss out on this. Econ the economic opportunities that are available. Um, and so that's a lot of the work that I do um, and is directly related to like how I grew up. Um, entre entrepreneurship has always been seen as this vessel for freedom, for uh, generational wealth and all of these things. And there's a very similar huge opportunity that's about to start happening here in the ocean when we kind of, as it kind of goes through this, I guess, industrial phase where you have um, wind energy, all of these things, aquaculture, tons of opportunities. And what I'm seeing is the same people who, who t historically get um, access to this wealth taking advantage of it again. And communities like the ones I grew up, not having that same um, infrastructure, information to do that. And so that's a big part of like what drives me as well as I also really love the ocean. I love <laughs> scuba diving. And so um, selfishly, I also don't want to go scuba diving on dead coral reefs. And so, <laughs> um, so it's a mix of both. But um, yeah, there's definitely just like 
the communities that I grew up with and knowing the power of entrepreneurship, but also what economic opportunities can do for marginalized communities um, and not wanting to see those communities miss out on this new wave of innovation. So, yeah. Very good. Thank you. So I'm going to ask the next question. I'm going to start with you. Okay. okay. So I'm just giving you a heads up. Um, so what do you think are the biggest obstacles um, to making progress in the area of your interest? Um, and, and what can we do about those? Yeah. Um, so both of my parents are entrepreneurs. They f can't for any reason understand how I got into science, but I did. <laughs> um, <laughs> And because I kind of have that background growing up, but then I've also been in academia, you know, from undergrad to now, um, the silos that we kind of work in in academia are, I think, extremely detrimental to innovation, especially in the ocean. Um, especially when I think about, and I'll talk about this a little bit in my talk, but the intersection of ocean science and technology, mm -hmm. huge, endless possibilities there, and we're just not taking advantage of it. Um, and so you see all of this stuff that's happening <clears throat> excuse me, with AI, with machine learning, and there are very few people doing, integrating that work into our oceans um, and making our work more efficient, more cost effective, more accessible. Um, and so I think that's one barrier definitely is the fact that we work in these silos and you train to be a marine scientist um, instead of meeting people where they are and trying to under, help people understand how, if you have an engineering background, if you have a background in communication or business, you're an artist, how can you use those tools to help us dr address some of these pressing issues in the ocean? Because that's honestly what we need. Um, we have. We don't have enough ocean scientists, but um, there's a huge gap of like innovation and entrepreneur, I'm sorry, innovation um, and interdisciplinary work that needs to be done in our field that we're not really capitalizing on. Um, and so, yeah. Perfect, very good. Send in. I actually have the exact same thing, <laughs> uh, the idea of silos, because that's exactly what I've personally seen um, as someone who's not directly in the ocean space. Um, but I think this resistance to collaborate is something that keeps uh, that keeps coming up. Um, and so even something as simple as the, the blue carbon work I mentioned earlier, um, and something Anjali mentioned earlier as well, this idea of like the loudest voices seem to be coming up again and again. And the people who already are doing this work don't seem to be getting the same exposure. And so, especially with Blue Carbon, I'm seeing the bigger organizations, you know, would be publishing articles and studies um, about Blue Carbon as if it's a new solution when there has been a lot of communities who have been doing this work already. And so I feel like this reinvention of a wheel that has already been turning just seems like a waste of time. And so I feel like that is one of the biggest obstacles I'm seeing, um, this resistance to kind of go beyond uh, the, the community that you're used to. I think um, so. I think we need more people just being willing to open up, open up their networks a bit. Fantastic, good, Charlotte. Sure, and I hundred percent agree with both of you. And and so I I will maybe take a little bit of a bigger picture answer to your question, um, which I think for too long and still today we talk about the climate as one of the stressors. Mm -hmm. It is not one of the stressors. It is the stressor. Mm -hmm. There is no other threat to this planet that is bigger than the changing climate. There just isn't. And we, I believe, need to start acting and thinking. And that's why I think Duke's initiative and, and move toward in this direction is groundbreaking and to be applauded. But I think it is the first step of what many of us need to be doing across all of our facets. And, and I do not... I drive a hybrid car. I do not drive a full electric car. I am not perfect. I'm not talking. I'm not a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm trying to reduce my meat intake. But let's be clear, like, I'm not speaking from a um, a position of, um, I'm, I'm not speaking of a perfect position. I have my foibles and I have my things that I'm working on as well. But I don't think we, I don't think that we have thought as a society about the impacts that are going to happen to all communities both the communities on the Outer Banks that have the big houses and the communities that don't have big houses. And so I think all of these things together, I'm hoping we're able to come together as a community and address them. Um, I will say what we have done and what other funders, are, I think, are in this space are doing is on all of our applications, we have what we call a consideration of climate question. So if you want a grant from the Lenfest Ocean Program, you have to answer the question about how your grant and how the activities in your grant are either going to you're either taking account of climate change in your work or the work you're doing is addressing climate change and or how you're conducting your work is climate friendly. And we, luck I mean, we are in a, a, a privileged position that we can pay people to do that. 
so that is, I mean, that's also one of the issues that, you know, it is, mm -hmm. it's not cheap. Um, and so some of our grantees love that. Some of our grantees are saying, why are you asking me the climate question? And I'm saying, well, if you're about to replant seagrass, how do you know in 10 years that's the right seagrass to be there and it's not going to be underwater? So, I mean, I think there are these, you know, I mean, there's are kind of straightforward um, questions. Very good. Shannon. Oh, well, those have all been fantastic answers. <laughs> I'm going to build upon, agree with everything that's been said and take it sort of to a philosophical level of the way I see is one of the big, biggest obstacles that sort of is rooted in all of the other issues that we see facing the oceans. Um, and that's this perspective or the sort of this value system of still a very Western perspective of seeing people as separate from nature and people as inherently bad for nature. Um, and it's not to say that there, we, we are causing these major anthropogenic effects, but it's not inherent, right? It's not the only way that we can interact with our planet. And I think that narrative has become so dominant um, in, in Western society. And so I think really, you know, <laughs> indigenous communities across the world for thousands and thousands of years um, understood this way better than, you know, th our Western society has. And um, at least, yeah, and I think what we really need to do is think of ways of, of understanding how to bring those value systems into the current context in a way that isn't co-opting them or you know, a, a continuation of colonialism or um, you know, ways that can be done really poorly, but really thinking and being more open to reimagining and being more creative around um, the way, not just the way we think about how we exist uh, with our ecosystems, but also how that translates into policy. Because, um, you know, I think that conversation, I think that idea has become more commonly talked about, but I haven't seen it as much still translated into policy. So I think there's a place for marine protected areas and it kind of keeping, you know, people out of certain areas, but at the same time, that's not the only answer. And, it, you know, that's a, a contextually maybe appropriate approach, but I think being more creative around seeing that that relationship differently is really important. What I love about your answers to that, to both those questions, um, so there's two points I, I guess I would like to make. One is um, when we have more diverse voices in the room, we hear very different problem definitions, right? And we hear really different solution sets. And if we don't have those voices in the room, then we are missing a huge part of how we actually find sustainable and durable solutions to these issues. And so I'm really taken, you know, Anjali, when you say, you know, there's been a whole generation, if not generations of people who have been, you know, prevented from taking advantage of, of opportunities. And you, like you are a powerhouse um, in many different ways and your, your presentation is ready to go and we will definitely give you a chance to, <laughs> to get to that presentation, I promise you. Um, but if you don't have political representation, which is something you're working on, if you don't have representation in terms of the business community, you're missing something. If you don't have representation in the scientific community, you are working, you are missing something. And my friends, Anjali is doing all three of those things. <laughs> like she is a very, very busy woman. So I think, so I think there's really something to be said for that, right? And I think what we're hearing from Sanduni is, you know, these voices have been out there for a while. Why are we not listening to them more? and making sure they have an opportunity to come forward. And I think that's also what you're saying there, Charlotte, is like, let's try to find the vehicles through funding mechanisms that allow that to happen. And then Charlotte, what you're also saying is affirming sort of the larger, like we are all part of nature at the end of the day. And, you know, we all need to see the holistic approach that we can all be involved in for a more sustainable solution. So I just love the, the set of answers that you gave to that. That was pretty, very, very inspiring. And Charlotte, I like the whole idea. We're not going to shame our way to greatness. <laughs> um, like we are all at fault here in some meaningful way. And by pointing fingers, we're not going to make progress. So I think that's also a really good lesson. All right. We're going to do one more round robin. And then I'm going to turn it over to you, Anjali. And then um, we're going to open it up to questions from online. Okay. So I think that's, I'm just going to like give us all a moment of where we are headed here right now. So if you had, and I'm going to start with you, Charlotte, on this one, okay? Okay. Um, if you had $100 million, and maybe you do, <laughs> out of everybody here, maybe that's you, <laughs> um, what would you do with it to have the biggest impact in your area of work? 
yes, thank you. And sadly, my 13 year old asked me the same thing, which is, <laughs> if you have so much money, why aren't you giving any of it to me? Um, <laughs> that's a different panel. Um, Great question. And I will say, I'm going to answer that question in a slightly different mm -hmm. way. I do not have $100 million. I think there's not enough. Um, there are never enough resources, but I think the challenge is there are never going to be enough resources. So what can we do mm -hmm. with what we have? I'm currently, um, apart from my day job, I'm also involved in uh, something called the United Nations... Oh gosh, what is it called? The United, what's the official name? The United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Mm -hmm. um, and while I'm not involved in many United Nations activities because that is a different aspect of policymaking on a global scale that works at a pace slower than I love. Um, <laughs> But it is a very, it is a, it is a very necessary and and an absolutely important thing to do. But um, it, this is really my first dive into the United Nations. Um, that process, this this the ocean science, the theme of that present of this next decade is the the science we need for the ocean we want, and they have developed a uh, method and a requirement for all scientific projects that get submitted to the UN for endorsement, which is kind of a, steel, a, a stamp of approval by the UN, um, to be what they call co-designed. And co-design is what I have been, is the way the Lenfest Ocean Program works. It's just a technical term that means scientists working with stakeholders, community members, tribes, indigenous individuals, and communities to develop and understand what science is needed not just not what science researchers want to do. And so it really flips on its head what science are we actually producing, what science are we funding in order to be useful and used mm -hmm. by those communities on the ground. And so if I had $100 million, I would put it into a new initiative we're just starting, which actually, we're, <laughs> oddly enough, we're trying to raise $10 million, which right now feels like $100 million, <laughs> um, to announce in June at a, um, a, at a UN meeting about a new initiative to fund co-design for all of these endorsed, to help all of these endorsed programs do the co-design they need to make their science useful and used. So I would Great. put, maybe I'd put 50 million into that initiative on co-design and then I'd take the other 50 and put it into the projects themselves. Very good, very good. Sandini, we'll go to you next. Uh, if I had 100 million, I would first strategize with <laughs> Charlotte. Um, <laughs> but I, I did reflect on this question quite a bit when uh -huh. uh, you sent it earlier. Um, and it made me think of a few months ago, I was contacted by an uh, organization, a conservation organization in Sri Lanka, who was wondering if, we, um, if I knew of any organizations that could donate money towards some diving equipment to conduct a cleanup at a coral reef in Sri mm -hmm. Lanka. And when I looked at the cost, you know, it, it wasn't a lot when you convert uh, Sri Lankan rupees to dollars, but um, the lack of financial resources in countries like Sri Lanka to conduct something as simple as a beach cleanup, um, that's what made me think of when I thought of that question. I would love to fund community-based, uh, you know, cleanup initiatives mm -hmm. in the ocean or any other ocean conservation initiatives that are um, missing those financial resources that communities could be leading on. Um, that's what I would love to fund. Um, and personally, because of my passion for tourism, um, I would look at, you know, coral restoration initiatives mm -hmm. that um, there are lots going on right now that some of these initiatives are not really working. Um, there's a lot of initiatives that start and slow down because of the lack of resources. Um, so th those are the areas that I would like to fund because I think there are people who have the skill set um, but are lacking the money to keep keep those skills going. Um, so that would be where I put the $100 million. Very good. Anjali, we'll go to you next. Yeah. Um, I would love $100 million. <laughs> uh, um, but I guess I think it probably goes back to this entrepreneurship background. Um, I, I think a lot about the how business operates and how we work in the ocean. Um, and what I don't think exists right now is an accelerator, kind of like they have for business startups. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to, to do something like that where we're isolating different critical, you know, um, gaps in what we're from, whether it's conservation um, or business or technology in the oceans. 
um, and then helping those solutions or businesses scale so that they can actually make a difference. Because I think we don't have a shortage of great ideas in this space. We really don't have the funding that a lot of other mm -hmm. sectors have mm -hmm. um, to scale these solutions so that they are actually impactful global globally. So um, yeah, that's what I would try to do. Very good, Shannon. Gosh, I'm rethinking my, <laughs> my response. Um, I, yeah, the 100 million, I'm not an entrepreneur and I, money is like scary to me almost because I'm <laughs> like, I, that's like a, a quantity that's just, I, it's hard for me to grasp. Um, but I think my, my, my answer essentially intersects with a lot of what, what you already said. Um, my, as a researcher and thinking from a research and a social scientist perspective, um, a lot of my work has been using participatory research methods. So again, really dovetails with all the themes that we've been talking about. Um, and specifically visual uh, re uh, participatory methods. So mm -hmm. uh, community film and community photography as tools um, to for communities and uh, specifically I work with fishing families um, to be able to share what's most important to them. So this gets at what, what your pr programs at LenFest are really aiming to do. The incubator um, <laughs> with the blue carbon and really thinking about how communities, um, what's valuable to them, how can they retain value in this burgeoning um, market, carbon market. Um, but I would really, uh, I would love to create a network of uh, fishing family community um, research efforts um, that that are driven and co-designed um, by those communities to be able to build a, a framework and a plan for you know what's meaningful and valuable to them, rather than having you know researchers like myself come in and be like, you need to stop doing destructive fishing. Right. Um, well, maybe there's good reasons, or you know that community and that context are, is using are using destructive practices, um, and what are solutions uh, and if they see it as a problem, what are their, you know, their ideas around doing that? But then not just, I think one of our issues as researchers is we come in and ask all these questions. We don't necessarily have solutions, which is why I love what you all are offering. Um, but then being able to have them funding to actually facilitate and, and provide capacity to pursue those, those um, challenges or, or triumphs, you know, whatever it is that, the, that they value and care about. Very good, well, thank you. I think then, I think we're ready for you, Anjali. We're going to give it another shot. Thank you all for your patience. Let me give you a round of applause to everybody for just that portion of our afternoon. And we'll turn it over to you, Anjali. So I was correct. It does have innovation in the title. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I could give you. Um, but I'm extremely excited to be here with you all. Thank you for this amazing discussion. Um, and I'm going to try and reintroduce myself a little bit. Uh, my name is Anjali Boyd. I am a a marine ecologist, an educator, entrepreneur, and I'm also a, a public servant here in Durham, North Carolina. But at Duke, I'm also a PhD student in the Marine Science and Conservation Program through the Nicholas School of the Environment. Um, but before I was any of those things, I was a young black girl from the Bull City, mm -hmm. um, growing up just about 15 minutes from here, actually. And like I said earlier, I grew up in a community that has a very rich history of black success, innovation, entrepreneurship, and leadership. And also ended up with two parents who are entrepreneurs, so they are extremely confused sometimes. <laughs> 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 and while I had no idea that you know, marine science existed for most of my um, life, what I did know is that I liked being outside, I liked animals, I was fascinated by technology, um, and I liked learning and exploring with my hands and doing hands-on activities. And so from years of watching Nat Geo, Animal Planet, Discovery, the only career I could actually envision that kind of compiled some of those things was being a wildlife veterinarian. So we pursued that for a pretty long time. Um, fun fact, I'm allergic to pretty much anal any animal that has fur. <laughs> um, so it definitely would have been a really bad uh, career option. I literally talked to veterinarians about taking Claritin. It was really bad. Um, but I didn't end up going that route. And I ended up in the water. And I have zero regrets about that. Really great decision. I'm not allergic to anything. So yeah, um, pretty successful so far. And while I would love to tell y'all that I, you know, went off to college, fell in love with marine science, um, and this has just been the spheric tale of a career, that simply has not been my truth. The reality is this field has been extremely isolating um, and hard to navigate as a black woman. 
and I could tell y'all about all these challenges and barriers I overcame and whatnot, but we have eight minutes and y'all are not my therapist. So <laughs> what we're gonna do is talk about some of the stats to hopefully paint this picture for you. Um, throughout undergrad, I was the only black student in all of my major classes all four years. In the eight years that I've been in this field, I have never had a person of color as a research advisor. Actually, I've almost solely had white men. And when I came into this program in 2020, I was also the only black student in the program, like I was in an undergrad. Um, I am happy to announce that there's four of us now. Um, two of them are my friends that I recruited, uh, but you know, a win is a win, so we're gonna take that. Um, and while I would like to really wish I could say that these have just been my experiences, um, they haven't. All of my black colleagues have similar stories, if not worse. Um, and the data tells us that the field that we're in, the field that I'm in, is no more diverse today than it was 40 years ago, despite all of the diversity, equity, and inclusion work and all the money that has been poured into those efforts. And so those experiences paired with my knowledge over the last eight years about how important the oceans are, um, the economic opportunities available in ocean industries, um, as well as the fact that climate change the consequences of climate change disproportionately affect communities of color all fuel the work that I do today, which is developing low cost, novel, and cost effective restoration, ecosystem based restoration and management, wow, tongue twister, um, practices to restore marine ecosystems globally. And to do this work, I incorporate a couple of different disciplines from community ecology, marine restoration, um, coastal resource economics and management as well as looking at ways that we can use innovative technology, such as AI, machine learning, 3D printing, to make our work more effective and cost efficient. And I also, by doing this work and working at the intersections of all these fields, get to work on pretty interdisciplinary teams. And so I've worked with students and researchers from diverse backgrounds with varying interests, um, everywhere from engineering and computer science to policy and anything in between. And by working on these teams, um, I've learned a lot. There have been a lot of insights. I often think that I am learning way more than I'm contributing to these teams. <laughs> um, but one of the, the, some of the biggest insights that I've kind of realized over the last couple of years kind of lies this intersection of ocean science and conservation and technology. The first being that technology, there's been like crazy advances in technology in just the last two to three years alone. Um, and these technological advances have the ability to make our work more accessible, more efficient, more cost effective, if we leverage them right. Um, and I will say, in my opinion, we're not doing enough of that work to bridge that gap. And also, by working at the, the, sorry, the intersection of two interdisciplinary fields, it's a huge, a great avenue for increasing diversity and equity within our field. Um, and I've seen this firsthand from the work that I do, the teams that I get to work on. I've also experienced this in my own life, right? So, like I said, I have these different hats and experiences that I've worn over the years, um, but yet those other parts of me, if you will, have not always been valued as highly or as equal to my scientific contributions, despite the fact that all of these are kind of what fuel the person I am as a scientist, how I approach science, the collaborative nature that I take um, in my research. And so as we think ahead to this, you know, the UN decade, this new wave of innovation um, in the oceans, I think we have to embrace disruption because there's gonna be a lot of it. Um, and I will definitely be there helping to disrupt a lot of things, hopefully. <laughs> um, but also we have to um, look for ways that we can integrate uh, people from different, have, that have different skill sets and backgrounds into our oceans. And not only for them to help us solve these pressing issues, but also make sure that they're aware of all the economic opportunities available to them in this field. Regardless of if you have an engineering background, have no idea what the water does, like you don't know about currents, you don't need to know all that stuff. You know, there's enough of us scientists to help bridge that gap if we can work more collaboratively. And that is it, thank you. Thank you very much, Anjali. So I think, and I'm just doing, taking a check. We have until 3.30, am I correct in our timing? Perfect, so we've got about 20 minutes for to host questions. Um, Katie, do you have some questions for us back there? Uh, yeah, let's start with the questions in the room. Okay, all right, let's start with the questions in the room. Very good, any questions that we might have from the audience for these wonderful women? Yes.
there are two houses between me and the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of a critical little spot. Um, I have children and grandchildren, and I want them to grow up and be able to enjoy that property, um, the house, and the sand on which it sits. Um, I'm also trained as an epidemiologist, a psychiatric epidemiologist, and that might sound a strange thing to say here today, um, but my field is trauma. And I'm hearing a lot of kind of rumblings in my field about trauma associated with climate change. And it's not just trauma. As, I mean, there, we all know there's acute trauma from earthquakes and hurricanes and things like that. But it's more the chronic aspects of trauma, like um, forced migration um, because of, of climate change or um, insecurity about having enough water um, or excessive heat. And I wonder if, I mean, that's kind of a new voice that I have haven't, or new space that I haven't heard anybody touch on here, and I wondered if they're, if you're hearing the same things that I am, and if anybody is investigating trauma associated with climate change, or the psychological aspects of it. Anybody want to tackle that? I can't tackle that one, but I did go to an excellent session yesterday. <laughs> There's an which is not going to help you unless. Um, it, it, which may not help entirely, although it would be in the program. There was an excellent session yesterday on women, climate, and health, which wasn't specifically about trauma, although mental health was a very large was a was a uh, substantial part of the discussion because they talked a lot about heat stress for women, particularly in particularly underserved communities or communities that didn't have um, were choosing between running the air conditioner and buying food and or medicines um so there was the acute piece of of climate change but there also is such a strong i think there is a growing but in that panel they pointed out a, a need for additional research on the mental health aspects and i'll just say personally my whenever there is a climate story on the news we turn it off because my my 13 year old same one who wants all the money um <laughs> really has has is very anxious about his climate future Yeah, I also, it's not my expertise, but I do know a lot of social scientists who do similar work in that area. Um, it's definitely a big issue um, with displacement and the sense of home and like what that looks like as it being. So yeah, there's a, a huge area. I don't know if there's a ton of research being done in the area um, compared to some other fields, but I think it's extremely important. And I also see very similar trends with like my peers, people younger than me, very nervous about what the future looks like for them. Um, whether they should have kids, if it's ethical or not. Like, yeah, those are different conversations that are definitely coming up um, at this point. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I've intersected with this recently in two ways. One is with the communities that I've worked with, um, in, primarily in Indonesia, um, where the, the there's two seasons. There's more of a calm weather season and a rough weather season. And that rough weather season is extending um, and becoming longer throughout the year. So they didn't talk about climate change, um, but they talked about you know not being able to fish as many days of the year, um, using destructive practices like blast fishing as an as a way to make up for that those lost days where they can't go as far out to sea. Um, and so it's it's putting a lot of stress and, and not necessarily being articulated that way, but in that context. And then I'm also teaching, um, I just started teaching, this is my second semester, uh, the Capstone Environmental Studies course for our senior students um, at Cal State San Marcos. And my goodness, that came up every day, uh, climate anxiety. And we, we actually worked through a book, I think it's, I'm forgetting the name, I think it's the Climate Anxiety Toolkit uh, by Sarah Renfrit, Dr. Sarah Renfrit. I think she's based at Cal State. Humboldt, or, um, if I'm not, if I'm remembering correctly, but anyway, that's a, that was a great resource, um, and that really resonated with students um, as far as like ways to you know maintain your health, your mental health, and also the will to keep doing this sort of work right in this space. Um, and then another great tool, which I think probably all of, a lot of you have probably heard of, is um, the book All We Can Save mm -hmm. with um, Dr. Ayana Johnson and. I'm not remembering the second author, um, uh, editor. And it's a compilation of all women authors, appropriate for this event, um, and just a phenomenal array of different uh, people tackling climate from different angles, and but also sharing their very personal experience with the trauma in different ways and anxiety that it's caused them. So those are the two books we read in the course, and that was really they were really helpful unpacking a lot of that. 
So I recommend those. Yeah. And just a quick thought, because I think everyone has touched upon some of the things I would have also mentioned, especially about climate anxiety. Um, students in my program, we talk about these conversations of feeling anxious about what's coming um, in the climate crisis and what's already happening in some of our own countries. Um, but I feel like because we're all in a space where we're working on these issues, it's almost a way of how we're dealing with that problem. Um, I don't know how exactly to put that into words, but it's almost like we feel like we're contributing in some way. Um, but because she mentioned a book, um, um, Shannon, I also wanted to add a book to the to the list. It's called The Blue Mind. Um, it's an older book, um, I think by Duke Allen, um, the author. Um, and that book talks a lot about the, the well-being aspects and the health aspects of the ocean, of just being near the ocean or in the ocean. And that book has really helped me um, as well, just to kind of think through some of these problems. Um, so just wanted to add that to the Very list. Good. And I'll add one more thing. You know, we uh, launched in our inaugural year this year, we started teaching here at Duke a course called Let's Talk About Climate Change. Um, we had uh, 300 students end up taking that. It's taught by Emily Bernhardt, a biologist, and uh, Norman Worsba, a theologian. So it's taught out of both biology and divinity. Um, and the title itself sort of conveys... I think the uneasy relationship that we have when we think about climate, right? We, we're scared to talk about it, and we need to talk about it because that anxiety is there. So the very title of the course is meant to sort of encompass the challenges that we are f facing, I think, with it. It's a really great course. It's taught by 12 faculty fellows representing disciplines from all across the university, whether that's history or medicine or biology or theology or romance languages, um, you know, engineering, nursing, it's its a really, really cool course. So I think that's just another way. Like, we need to lean into that question, I think, and really sort of tackle it. Other questions that you all have? Back here, right there in the corner, and then up here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm probably one of the older folks in this room. No, you are older. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, my anxiety is not for myself, but for my grandchildren. And um, Charlotte mentioned that the judges did not understand science. Our policymakers don't understand science. And it is really scary to me that the policymakers don't seem to really care about this. I mean, there are some who do. And I think part of the anxiety that I feel about climate change is the fact that I feel like I can't do, I, I can do my own kind of conservation things. But the policy issues that need to be made to make a difference, I don't feel that I can do anything about it. I can vote. But in, it doesn't actually change some things, you know. And that's, that's part of the anxiety that, that I feel. When I think, for the, many of you know the name of Orrin Pilkey. <laughs> okay. He has been talking about for decades the problem of building big houses on the coast and what we are doing to our coast. And it, they've just gotten bigger. <laughs> so that's my anxiety and my frustration. And if y'all have got any answers for it, I would appreciate it. I can talk to my therapist about it. So I think the question is sort of like, does science matter? And um, where does maybe science matter most? Maybe we, I can frame it along that, that way. Is that all right? Yeah. Very good. Um, so anybody want to tackle that? Yeah, I feel that a lot. Um, I'm also an elected official, so I've seen the policy side of it. It is disheartening a lot of the times. Um, government moves, you know, we talk about the UN, government moves very slow, okay? Um, and so, yeah, it is disheartening. And I think part of how I, I guess, deal with it is trying to understand the problem in the context of the society we live in, right? Um, and so a lot of the the business stuff, it also helps me with like, we live in a capitalistic society, right? How do we get businesses with these large corporations, right? Um, who disproportionately 
are causing these issues to, to care. Um, and so a big part for me, I think, is trying to communicate, because I see this gap too in academia. We're doing all this cool research, nobody reads it but us. <laughs> that helps nobody. Um, and so a big part of my work is trying to bridge that gap between those two sectors, because I think where, where money goes, innovation happens, solutions happen, things of that nature. Where does the money go? We're bis businesses for the most part. Um, and so for me, I guess, it's trying to bridge the gap between ocean sciences and the various big corporations that exist um, today um, and trying to prove to myself, but also prove to other people that you can pro make a profit and do good for the environment at the same time. Like those two things do not have to be in conflict. Um, and so that's the work that I do, which I think is impactful and like how I see the world. Um, so yeah, hopefully I answered that. Very good. Go ahead. Great answer. I think that the one thing I would add to that is, well, I, I would say that I hope science matters because my career has been right. in trying to make <laughs> science matter. Um, but all jokes aside, I think the, I think you're exactly right in what you're saying and that um, it seems that a lot of times people aren't listening to the science, but I think we have to not treat science as a, um, a separate entity. Science is part of every other conversation we're having. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do, which I have seen change, is science needs a seat at the table, just like innovation and business and advocates or NGOs and all sorts of industry and policy and, and everything else. And that has been, I think, harder to accomplish in past decades because scientists haven't leaned in to those conversations the way they do now. And this and Duke is an exception to this. this the Nicholas School of the Environment, those individuals are not are researching topics of about the planet. They are very much leaning into those conversations. That is not the case across the country or certainly across the world is there are many institutions that don't reward their, you know, the tenure track is not, uh, is about publish or perish. It is not get involved in your community and make a difference. And that is one of you know, the academic incentives around making science matter need to change. And they're, they're frankly a whole group of other foundations under the Transforming Evidence Funders Network that are, that are trying to lean into changing academic incentives around having science, having scientists who work on societally transformative issues get rewarded with tenure the same way they do with academic publications. And so this is an entire societal change that is coming about, but it is starting to take shape now. And that, you know, that's on climate as well as every other environmental issue. And frankly, it, it crosses healthcare, it crosses education, it crosses, um, in, you know, as well as environment. So, Very good. anybody else want to tackle it? Um, I w just wanted to briefly add. I think um, going from having been at here, be being at Duke and Stanford, two very elite institutions um, with uh, you know a lot of money, very research focused incredible places to do work and research and be. Um, and then going back to the Cal State system, the public school system, um, I have seen a, a heartening trend, at least in that space, where it's more of teaching focused university, um, that there, there are starting to be more incentives for that type of um, like community engaged work and, and, and science communication and um, that sort of facing work. So that's, at least in that space, I can speak to seeing some hope around that. Um, the other thing was I, I'm teaching an environmental policy course um, and back we talk about this a lot about you know we're covering all these dire topics that you know if you if you think about when the fundamental environmental laws were created in the 70s um, you know what have we actually seen change since then like have we you know what mm -hmm. sort of progress have we actually made um, and students get very disheartened but I, I try to point out that like for example the textbook we were, are working with was printed in 2019 and it has a chapter on climate and it says no meaningful policy has mm -hmm. been put for put through by Congress on climate but the, this year in the fall I could say well the Inflation Reduction Act mm -hmm. at least it's something you know it's not perfect but it is there and that you couldn't say that when this book was published mm -hmm. so I try to remind students that it's a slow progression forward, and it's a lot of steps back, but the overall movement is in the right direction. Um, but it's not to say we don't need more and to do it better, but yeah, I try to keep that perspective at least. <laughs> Cindy? 
Well, this is a very specific example to your question, um, but something I've noticed is since I'm very interested in tourism is that in some countries, they're really trying to build partnerships with academic uh, universities and organizations that are doing science-based uh, initiatives and building those um, collaborations to do actual science-based work to help um, deal with some of these environmental issues because they're aware that these risks from climate change are also going to affect their uh, long-term profits. And so I think that's been also kind of interesting to see these um, collaborations between um, university, local universities and the hospitality sector to kind of addri address those issues. Very good. And I will add on to what you just said is, um, you know, in addition to the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, the previous year, we had the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which has, you know, tens of billions of dollars, basically, to help us deal with a whole variety of issues of climate change, including powerful incentives for new businesses and industry. And also, we've got sort of the Environmental Justice 40 initiative that is part and parcel of that, that is meant to say 40% of the, the funds should be going to communities that basically don't usually get these kinds of opportunities. The other piece of legislation that I will offer up there is the CHIPS Act. And while certainly a big portion of that is meant to target, um, you know, our, our CHIPS infrastructure, our digital infrastructure, there's another great big portion of that bill that is also dedicated to new and different types of technology, some of it related to climate change. So I think we have three really incredible pieces of legislation that have come up over the last two years. So the, and, and you know, in our current environment, which is so politically polarized, getting anything through Congress is a major victory. The other thing I'll point to is that we have a long history, actually, of bipartisan support around um, parks, protected area, protected areas and land conservation that goes back literally hundreds of years. And that is an unsung story, basically, in our country. We don't like to say that too loud, I think, because we're worried to rock that boat. Um, but I think it's just something for us also to remember, is that there are some victories out there. So I think that's very good. Another question? Back here? Yeah. Yeah, you. Um, so I, I want to thank you for all these talks. I think they're great. Um, I think a lot of people have mentioned that there's a lot of anxiety around, like, kind of what can we do? I mean, do you guys have any tips on what we could do as individuals, you know, because we're not in a, our careers are not in research or something we can directly impact or on a bigger scale. You don't have time to advocate because other things are going on. Do you guys have any, like, what, what three things are things that we could do as individuals to help with progress mm -hmm. in this field? I can start us off. <laughs> um, and so this is a very specific example, but because of my passion is sustainable tourism, um, something I would recommend is, you know, start with your own um, travels. Um, whenever you're traveling, think of how you could um, be more sustainable, find organizations that are doing initiatives where you can be involved, um, whether that's uh, a beach cleanup or a coral restoration initiative. If that's something that interests you, I think there are more and more organizations that are looking to um, engage with travelers um, to be in involved in that kind of work. And so I would say find a way to um, be more sustainable with your travel because travel is a big part of the missions that are contributing to the climate crisis. So there you would be able to make uh, quite an impact um, if you make some change. And I want to give a little bit of a shout out. Beth, Beth Ray Schroeder is here, um, who runs Duke Travels. We had a whole group master's project, was it three years ago now, Beth, I think it was, that worked with uh, Beth and the the travel that Duke does to try to identify the most sustainable options possible. And so, I mean, that's something that we've tried to do by leveraging our students and working with, you know, within Duke as a whole. Do you want to say anything more? Uh, thank you. I would just like to add to what Sanduni said. I love Sanduni and I voted for you and Jolly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> if... Part of what we've been working on is also educating our travelers because the money is important. So what you can also do, like Sanduni said, is, is get involved in these different projects. But even just with your travel, if you if the if the traveler demands that an, an operator sources their seafood sustainably or um, works only with local guides or puts money back into the to the destination that you're going to visit then the business will change their business because they will make money they're not tied to running an unsustainable business they're doing what you demand it's all you can do that you can demand the change and you can make it happen so thank you very good thank you 
who else would like to tackle this question? Yeah, um, I guess, I mean, if you're thinking of a career change, we could always <laughs> use. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, if you are ever thinking, you know, you want to put your skills to use in another industry, please join us. Um, we could use all the help we could get. Um, I think other things are, I guess, like investments. Most people invest their money in different funds and stuff like that. And so thinking of ways that you could put your money towards ocean innovation, science, things of that nature um, are great things. I mean, I remember I was actually taking a business class, a sustainable business class, and they had a guest speaker who um, ran like a venture capitalist um, uh, company. And one of the, the barriers she identified with a lot of the ocean solutions that a lot of venture capitalists don't put money into it because they don't understand the ocean. And so I think there's a big gap there too with like how we get more money put into these different industries mm -hmm. Um, with so few people really understanding the ocean. And so um, that's also definitely an option as well as some of the other options that have been put out. Very good. I think we are at the end of time, unfortunately. Um, so I'm going to close us out. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'll turn it back over to Katie to co close us out, evidently. So I just want to say thank you to everybody. And Katie, it's all yours. Absolutely. Um. Let's get, let's get one more round of applause for Toddy and our speakers, Anjali, Sanduni, Charlotte, and Shannon. Uh, today's session was recorded and will be posted to the Women's Weekend virtual ticket and the Forever Learning Institute playlist for the lifelong, on the Lifelong Learning YouTube channel. Um, our next session of the Forever Learning Institute will be on March 28th, and we'll be looking at impacts of climate change from a variety of disciplinary lenses. We look forward to seeing you at the next uh, Forever Learning Institute.